Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, brief, brief introduction of mine. I am Dr. Usman Musharraf. I am currently working as consultant endocrinologist at Allied Hospital, Faisalabad. I welcome you all on PESCON 2020 Day 5 afternoon session on behalf of Pakistan Endocrine Society. Uh, we have, we're having an exciting uh, topic uh, for today's discussion. That is on that uh, the topic will be on adrenal diseases. So, uh, Dr. Vakas Shafiq, who is a leading endocrinologist at Shogasana Memorial Hospital, uh, will chair this scientific session. Uh, we have two well-known endocrinologists for our panel of experts, Professor Dr. Najmul Islam and Dr. Abdul Jabbar. Uh, professor Dr. Najmul Hassan is uh, the, lead, the uh, professor of endocrinology at Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi, and a leading endocrinologist, a renowned figure. And Dr. Abdul Jabbar, who is uh, currently working as consultant endocrinologist at Mohammed bin Rashid University Hospital of uh, University of Health Sciences, Dubai. We'll, we will be having two sessions. Each will be of 25 minutes duration. Uh, in first session, there will be a talk on adrenal incident loma by an international speaker. In our uh, second session, uh, there will be two case-based discussions or rare adrenal pathology by two um, national speakers. At the end, end of each um, session, we will have a question and answer uh, for 10 minutes, and uh, we will have expert panel opinion uh, during that question and session time period. You can drop your question in question and answer box or chat box. Uh, we will take your question at the end of each uh, discussion. For the first session, we have an international speaker, Dr. Fahad Ali Wali Ahmed. Dr. Fahad is consultant diabetologist at Royal uh, Sussex County Hospital, United Kingdom. So without any further delay, I would request Dr. Fahad Ali uh, to take the proceeding for his uh, talk on adrenal incident lomas. Over to Dr. Fahad Ali. Thank you. Share my screen. Yes, can everyone see my presentation? Yes. yes, we can. So, thank you for inviting me to Pakistan Endocrine Society to talk about adrenal incidentaloma. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Fahad Wali Ahmed. I'm a consultant endocrinologist at Brighton and Sussex University Hospital in the United Kingdom. I have nothing to disclose. During this session, I'll talk about the prevalence of adrenal incidentaloma and also how this problem has become a common condition in our endocrine clinic. And when we are managing patients with adrenal incidentaloma, uh, we need to ask four key questions. Um, and it is important that we have a strong multidisciplinary team so that we can avoid any diagnostic pitfalls um, we can discuss unusual cases and also provide an effective patient care. So we will start with uh, a case. Uh, so it's a quite a straightforward case in an endocrine clinic, 65 year old uh, gentleman who presented to our emergency department after a paragliding accident. As a part of trauma protocol, he had a full body CT scan. Uh, fortunately, he did not have any major internal injuries but he was told that he had a small uh, 1.9 centimeter left adrenal nodule. So as the case highlights, um, the adrenal incidentaloma is defined as an adrenal mass, which is detected on imaging performed for reasons other than for suspected adrenal disease. Therefore, this excludes any adrenal incidentaloma or adre adrenal nodule, which is picked up on imaging as a part of our workup for ad ad adrenal hormone excess or as a part of our surveillance for hereditary syndromes like uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia 2, SDH mutation, uh, which can later develop adrenal tumors. Adrenal incidentaloma is quite a common problem in my endocrine clinic and in general uh, endocrine clinic all over the world. Um, it, the prevalence depends on which series we look at. I mean, if you look at the radiological series, there will be slight variation, autopsy series or surgical series. But in general, it's around two to three percent in general population. The reason we see uh, this condition more often in our clinic is because of the fact that we, uh, the, a lot of diagnostic uh, imaging is being undertaken. And we can see that 
in general, I think in, uh, in around, I think in around 2018, we uh, in UK, we had around 5 million CT scans undertaken. And out of those, 5% of the cross-sectional imaging will have an adrenal incident loma. Therefore, we see quite a lot of patients being referred to our clinic um, uh, with adrenal uh, lesion uh, picked up um, as a part of a, a workup for different conditions. Another problem is that this, is, uh, this condition is age dependent. Uh, this is quite an old study uh, and we can see that uh, the prevalence is quite low uh, at a younger age. So it's extremely rare to have an adrenal lesion in somebody below the age of 30. But as the age increases, the prevalence also increases. Uh, it usually peaks around the fifth and the seventh decade. And um, the prevalence is around seven to 8% um, uh, in, by the age of 70. Why do we need to investigate these adrenal lesions? And the answer lies in the etiology um, of these adrenal lesion. And again, um, depending on the series we look at, um, uh, we will find different uh, uh, percentage of um, uh, the differential diagnosis. In general, around 75% of patients will be benign and will have a non-functioning adrenal lesion. But that leaves around 25% of the patients and they could, uh, they could have a functional lesion, uh, which could be cortisol secreting, uh, they could have a lost one secreting lesion, or it could be fibromocytoma. Or more seriously, they could have adrenal carcinoma or metastasis. Uh, in general, in the series, there is slight overestimation of uh, the functional lesions or the, uh, the malignant lesions. The reason being is that it, it basically, uh, it depends on the, the patients they have selected. So majority of the patients who have their adrenal taken out, uh, they, will, they will either be functional or at least have a suspicion of being functional or, or being malignant. So therefore there is slight overestimation in the literature. So when we see our patients in our uh, endocrine clinic, um, there are four key questions I would like to answer. First is, is it functional or non-functional? The second is, is it benign or malignant? Usually the first and the second question I try to answer at the same time. Um, after I've answered this, the next question uh, I'd like to answer is, do we need to do surgery in this patient? And the lastly, I think if we are not performing any surgery, if there's any follow-up needed. And there's an excellent guideline published in 2016 uh, by European Society, uh, which I will be, uh, be, uh, 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 ask uh, participants to have a look. It's an excellent uh, um, uh, guideline to follow. So when I'm looking at a patient, um, it's as usual, I think it goes beyond saying that we need to take a good history and examination. We need to look for symptoms and signs of hormone excess, for Cushing disease, pheochromocytoma, or, or Cohen syndrome. I always like to have a blood pressure in, in all of these patients. Once I've taken a history and examination, uh, I then go with the investigations. Um, I usually will assess catecholamine and I usually either perform a plasma-free metanephrine or a 24-hour urine fractionated metanephrine. And usually sensitivity and specificity of this test is really, very really good. If the patient has a history of hypertension or unexplained hyperkalemia, then I will undertake a resting aldosterone and plasma renin activity test. If I have a suspicion of malignancy or hyperandrogenism, then I'll uh, undertake um, a sex steroids. And then I will assess, assess, uh, assess cortisol hypersecretion. And this is the, the condition where most clinicians find challenging uh, because, uh, because uh, it's, it's, it's uh, quite difficult. Patients may have sign and symptoms, but the test may be negative or the test may be positive and patient doesn't have the sign and symptoms. In general, the clinical judgment is very important. The one milligram overnight dexamethasone suppression test is the recommended test by the guideline, but other tests can also be undertaken like 24 hour urine cortisol or late night cort salivary cortisol. I usually prefer overnight dexamethasone suppression test. And by the European Society guidelines, uh, what they have done, they have divided or subdivided the, uh, the outcome of the dexamethasone suppression test into three main groups. If uh, uh, the post dexamethasone cortisol levels is less than 50 nanomoles per liter or 1.8 micrograms per deciliter, then we class the test as a pass or a normal uh, result. But if, there is, if the cortisol level is more than 138 or five micrograms per deciliter, then we class this as autonomous cortisol secretion. 
Um, in some patients, I use a higher dose of dexamethasone, and it depends on the clinical judgment that I'm looking for an autonomous uh, cortisol production. I'm not looking for a pituitary uh, Cushing's. So in some patients like obese patients, I may use a two milligram test. Furthermore, this test, uh, even though I think if a patient has a less than 50 nanomoles per liter, the sensitivity is very good, but we, we have a very poor specificity. So we will have a lot of false positive. Similarly, if you look at uh, uh, the higher level 138, uh, the sensitivity is, is quite good around 90, 95%, but the specificity is also around uh, 95%. So we can have up to 5% of patients who will have a false positive test. So once I've done the test, if, if the results are normal, that is 50 nanomoles per liter, uh, then I usually do not undertake further testing until unless the patient's clinical picture uh, changes. If the result shows that there is an auto, so, uh, autonomous uh, cortisol secretion or a possible autonomous cortisol secretion, then I usually uh, go and assess the comorbidities, which I've already done while taking the history and examination. The thing which I look at is hypertension, does the patient have diabetes? Uh, is the patient obese or putting on weight? Uh, and have they got dyslipidemia or osteoporosis? Again, the problem lies here that we know that adrenal incident loma is age dependent. And similarly, these problems like hypertension, uh, type two diabetes, osteoporosis is again age, age dependent. So as the age increases, uh, the prevalence increases of these conditions. And some of the condition can uh, give a high false positive test like patients who are obese. That's why in those patients, depending on the clinical picture, I sometimes use a higher dose of dexamethasone. So therefore the recommendation is to basically provide an individualized care. And if there's a suspicion that we need to proceed further, then we need to do additional testing like uh, ACTH levels, sometimes repeat the dexamethasone suppression test or proceed with a low dose dexamethasone test. Uh, I think we should use all these tests in our armory to provide guidance that do we need to proceed with, the, uh, uh, with, with any treatment or not. And if uh, there is clinically significant cortisol excess, then we should recommend a relectomy. But again, it goes with the patient choice, patient discussion, and multidisciplinary team uh, outcome. So coming back to our case, uh, the patient didn't have any past medical problem. He was fairly fit and um, slim. His metanephrines were normal and overnight dexamethasone is 32 nanomoles per liter. I did not do any uh, free chromocytoma, uh, uh, the renin aldosterone uh, test, uh, because the patient did not have uh, uh, hypertension and an explained hyperkalemia. Therefore, uh, this lesion is a non-functioning lesion. The next question which I like to answer, is it benign or malignant? And for this, we need to undertake an imaging modality Usually recommended uh, modality by the guideline is uh, uh, non-contrast CT. And the reason being is that the most of the evidence uh, is based on that. But we can also do an MRI scan. Um, and in some cases, we do see patients coming to our clinic with a PET, PET positive uh, CT, but usually it is done in patients if we are trying to exclude malignancy. So the two key features I'm looking uh, on a scan is the density of the adrenal incident loma and the size and homogeneity. So what we are looking in the density is that is the um, lesion fat rich or not? So when we do a con non-contrast CT, uh, water is zero and uh, the bone has got a very high density and fat has a very low density. So the, if, we, if a lesion has got a Hounsfield unit or a density of less than 10, uh, then this lesion is uh, lipid rich uh, and therefore benign. Um, the sensitivity is extremely high uh, for this. So we can rule out malignant lesions quite clearly with this uh, criteria. The other criteria, uh, other tests we can use is a chemical shift MRI, again, looking for a loss of signal. Uh, CT with delayed uh, contrast media washout, I usually do if the lesion is uh, slightly uh, indeterminate, and then we look out the washout of the contrast from the lesion and if the absolute washout is more than 60% and the relative washout is more than 40%, then it usually suggestive of an adenoma. Uh, FGD PET, I uh, mentioned, I usually use uh, if I, I'm, I'm worried about malignancy uh, or I'm uh, uh, investigating the uh, malignant lesion. And usually what we're looking for an absence of FDG uptake um, or uptake less than the liver uh, in the lesion. After assessing the density, we look at the size. 
Um, in general, I think uh, this is quite a good study in 20, 2004, uh, we can see that a lesion which is less than four centimeters, 75% of the lesions will be benign. The risk of adrenal carcinoma is around one to 2% in a lesion less than four centimeters. However, once the lesion size increases more than four centimeters, the incidence of adrenal cancer increases. And if it's more than six uh, centimeters, the, uh, the incidence increases by, uh, to 25%. Therefore, using uh, the density and the size criteria, if uh, the density is less than 10 Hohenfels unit and the, the size is less than four centimeters uh, with a homogeneous morphology, morphology then in general, uh, it favors discharge and no further investigation with regards to, uh, are we, uh, uh, regards to answering a question for is it benign or malignant. But if the Hounsfield unit is more than 10 and the size is more than four centimeter or heterogeneous, this favors surgery or further investigations. So coming to our case number one, uh, the, the density is uh, minus three Hounsfield unit. Therefore, this is a benign lesion. Um, this is a non-functioning lesion and a benign lesion. Therefore, we discharge the patient and uh, the patient hasn't been given any follow-up. The guidelines were published in 2016. And since then, uh, there are a few very good publications which has come out. And the recent one published in Lancet where uh, they're looking at the, can we increase the, uh, uh, the criteria for Hounsfield unit to 20? And the reason being is that we know the sensitivity is quite good if the Hounsfield unit is less than 10 it's around 100%, but the specificity is quite low. By increasing the Hounsfield unit, uh, uh, the, the authors, uh, uh, Bancos and the team, they basically showed that sensitivity hasn't changed much, but their specificity has increased significantly. And when they combine uh, this with the size criteria, we can see that any uh, lesion which is four centimeter or below with the Hounsfield unit of uh, less than 20, they did not pick up any adrenal cortical cancer. But if the size is more than four, they only had one adrenal cortical cancer. So our guidelines are slightly lagging behind. And I believe that this will uh, be looked at uh, when the new guidelines are published. So what next if I have an indeterminate nodule? Definitely this needs a multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, this needs to be discussed. And we have three options. Do we need to do any further imaging uh, as soon as possible? Do we need to do an interval imaging at three months, six months, and 12 months, depending on the patient uh, clinical picture? Or do we need to do surgery uh, without further delay? So we come to us our second case. Uh, this is a 73-year-old female who came to um, uh, outpatients uh, at a different specialty with a weight loss and left-sided abdominal pain. She had a CT abdomen, which showed uh, indeterminate or uh, nodule, which is 11 centimeter and is a heterogeneous mass. So we just looking at the scan, we were quite worried about this patient. So we'll, we did some func uh, functional testing. The metanephrines were normal. The overnight dexamethasone suppression test did not suppress less than uh, uh, 50 and it is 86 nanomoles per liter. The patient had an elevated testosterone as well. So we sent further investigations for these patients immediately uh, with regards to imaging, but we, we decided to proceed uh, uh, with surgery as soon as possible. So patient had an adrenalectomy and the histology confirmed adrenal cortical cancer. I think I'll point one important fact here that any patients who is undergoing adrenalectomy uh, and has a, a overnight dexamethasone suppression test where, with a cortisol level of more than 50 nanomoles per liter, it's sh adrenalectomy should be undertaken under hydrocortisone cover. So we come to our third case. Uh, it's a 54 year old gentleman who was referred with weight loss and sweating. The patient had a CT chest abdo pelvis, which shows a bilateral adrenal mass, which is left dominant. The patient metanephrines were normal and overnight dexamethasone suppression test was normal. We were worried that this is definitely a malignant uh, uh, condition and our differential include, is it adrenal cortical cancer, lymphoma, or is it metastasis? LDH was normal and we sent a urinary steroid profile. And I'll come to that towards the end of my topic, uh, to my presentation. Um, the urinary steroid profile wasn't diagnostic for adrenal cortical cancer. Uh, the PET CT was undertaken and both, ma both masses were pet avid. So what next? And the question we discussed in our MDT was, do we need to do a biopsy? 
The general answer is that it is, we should never uh, perform um, a, a biopsy in an adrenal lesion in almost all of the cases, except for certain conditions that we want to exclude that is it a benign or a malignant lesion, especially if it's an extra adrenal metastasis or not. In all patients, if we want to proceed with a biopsy, a few chromocytoma should be excluded. And again, patient clinical condition should be looked at. Will a histology will affect the overall outcome of the patient? Because if it's not going to help the patient's uh, uh, prognosis, then the patient is already palliated, then I, I believe that then we should not proceed with the histological diagnosis, uh, especially with the adrenal biopsy. So the patient had an adrenal biopsy done and it uh, showed a metastasis of poorly differentiated carcinoma. And the patient was then referred to an oncologist with an interest of uh, uh, unknown primary and is under the, uh, the oncology scale at this moment. So coming towards some spatial uh, conditions like bilateral adrenal nodule, and we see that in our clinic. In general, the guidelines are very clear. And uh, the same thing I follow is that uh, my practice is similar as of unilateral nodules. So my imaging and hormonal workup would be same. The only extra thing which I consider is I send a 17 hydroxy progesterone to rule out congenital adrenal hyperplasia and also uh, uh, look to exclude adrenal insufficiency. And the indication for surgery is again similar to the unilateral nodule. But again, we need to proceed with, uh, uh, in an individualized manner, uh, uh, looking at the patient condition and also clinical judgment. If it's a bilateral fear, then definitely both glands would need to be taken out. Um, if it's a, a, um, a lostron secreting uh, tumor or it's a cortisol secreting tumor, then the evidence is quite limited. What do we do here? But in general, I think if it's a cortisol secreting tumor, then we may consider doing uh, adrenal venous sampling to look which side is more dominant. Um, uh, depending on the patient's clinical condition, we may try to resect the dominant site and see um, the, the outcome after the treatment that has this improved patient condition or not. Um, but evidence is quite limited in this area. Um, and uh, definitely uh, uh, considering bilateral adrenectomy uh, uh, should be taken uh, with care. Coming to the another condition which we see in our uh, uh, clinic is adrenal masses in extra adrenal malignancy. The first question which I try to answer, will any investigation help this patient? Uh, is the patient clinical uh, condition and prognosis good enough that we should need to proceed with further investigation? The first question which I like to answer is, is this benign on imaging criteria or is it indeterminate? If it's benign, then I proceed with a, a hormone excess or hormone testing. And if the hormones are high, then we are basically depending on the patient condition, then uh, we devise a treatment plan. If uh, the hormones are not excess, then we can basically manage the patient as primary malignancy. In general, if you look at the Hounsfield unit of less than 10 and with uh, the size criteria of less than four, the sensitivity is 93%. So we will miss some patients, even though they are uh, labeled as benign or imaging criteria, uh, which can have uh, extra uh, adrenal malignancy uh, metastasis. If the lesion is indeterminate, uh, definitely we need to proceed uh, uh, to exclude few chromocytoma. Uh, consider additional imaging modulated like FDG PET CT. And then again ask that do we need to proceed with uh, uh, the pathological assessment and then consider adrenal biopsy or resection. If it's not going to help the patient, then we need to manage the patient as of primary malignancy. So coming to uh, urinary steroid profile, I mentioned in my case three that we send a urinary steroid profile. Uh, profile for that patient. And this is a very interesting development. And I think this has been under development for nearly 10 years now. And this uh, uses a technology, uh, a mass spec technology, uh, to basically assess uh, urine, um, uh, uh, urinary uh, adrenal metabolites, um, and basically using uh, machine learning to differentiate between uh, a benign lesion and an adrenal cortical cancer. And actually, the sensitivity and specificity is very really high. And we have been using that in our patients uh, uh, for some time now, and we've had very good results. The similar group uh, undertook this uh, multi center trial uh, um, and published the results in Lancet. And what they showed that urinary steroid profile actually has a better pro uh, positive predictive value uh, than the size of more than four centimeter and the, and, and the density uh, of more than 20. But when they combine all, all the three, size, density, and urine, uh, the positive uh, predictive value, or the true positive remains the same, 
but actually the false positive will decrease significantly. So by using this, we can actually uh, manage the patient more effectively and uh, um, guide the patient either towards treatment uh, as soon as possible, or uh, uh, basically uh, tell our patients that uh, I think we are not worried about the lesion and basically avoid any unnecessary investigations on treatment. And what they found that using this criteria and looking at the histology, uh, out of around 500 surgeries, they basically uh, uh, did around 250 surgeries, which probably were not needed. So coming to the conclusion, um, adrenal incident loma is a quite a common problem. Uh, we need to make sure that we assess uh, uh, the lesion in a multidisciplinary team approach and has, have, has, has, and follow the guidelines or have, have a method in our clinic. We need to assess the functional status. Risk of cancer is low. And in general, this is overstated in the, the clinical series. And we need to use our clinical judgment and investigation to manage the patient. Thank you. I would like to thank my uh, MDT team, uh, uh, Dr. Trevor Wheatley and our surgeon, Tim Lana, and our radiologist, Jonathan Richenberg, uh, who basically sits on the panel uh, for our MDT. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Dr. Fahad. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Fahad, for uh, for your uh, nice, comprehensive, and uh, uh, very informative talk on adrenal pathology. Now, I would request uh, our chairperson, Dr. Vakas Yafi, to take over the proceeding for uh, uh, before start of session two uh, on question and answers. Over to Dr. Vakas Yafi. Thank you, Dr. Fahad. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, very clear. Um, we recently had a talk from Professor Gary Hammer uh, about the urinary metabolites, uh, and his group actually did quite a lot of his, um, his study and data on uh, recently, and he showed us. So probably in the future, we will have uh, different guidelines, and we'll probably we'll be using more urinary metabolites uh, in the future, and things will be much simpler. So um, I think your presentation actually help, will help us uh, because our cases will, uh, our, the next two presentation will have few questions which uh, we will check, with, which we will discuss with you as well. Um, so looking at the question at the minute, uh, there is one question is um, when to consider adrenalectomy with subclinical Cushing secondary to adrenal incident loma size versus attenuation so the so that's the first question so when to consider adrenalectomy with subclinical cushing secondary to adrenal incident loma so in general i think again going back to the clinical uh, uh, picture of a patient so i think the first thing to look at what are the comorbidities does the patient have diabetes does the patient have uh, a, 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 any osteopenia or osteoporosis uh, have they got hypertension what is the age of the patient? And again, uh, it's an individualized approach. In general, the guidelines uh, recommend, and I also follow that, that if uh, the patient does not have any of those features, uh, then I discuss the patient that I think we probably need to keep you under our follow-up and repeat the, the test uh, after some time. Um, and sometimes I use a higher dose of dexamethasone suppression test like two milligrams, and most of the patient's results come back normal. I usually add two tests, so like two milligram dexamethasone suppression test or a urinary steroid profile, or a slivery cortisol. And if the results are normal and the patients have no clinical signs uh, of um, uh, cort uh, uh, cortisol excess, just have an indeterminate kind of um, uh, the results, then I usually follow them up for a few years just to see if they develop symptoms. And also want patients to contact me if they develop any features, uh, then I usually will uh, look at that. But in general, patients who haven't had, uh, haven't got any clinical signs, then we, sh we should, uh, consider a conservative approach. And if you look at the, the specificity, even for a cutoff of 138, it's, a, uh, it's around 95. So we will have 5% of patients who have tested positive, but will not have Cushing. So clinical picture is the key here and, and how quickly that clinical picture is developing. And they may not have a clinical feature now, but two years time, they start developing it. So we can then uh, proceed with the surgery as quickly as possible at that case, in, the, in those cases. Thank you. Now I will ask the same question from our panelists, uh, so we can ask, uh, I can ask Dr. Najman Islam if he can comment on presentation and, and this, the uh, question. Uh, I mean, I thank you, Fahad, for a very comprehensive presentation on adrenal incidentalomas. Uh, regarding the question that was asked by one of the uh, listeners that about when to operate on patients, 
yes uh, obviously you have to discuss the patient discuss with the patient and the clinical features do matter but if you if there is a possibility that the patient may not be a regular follow up then you may if they they have the multiple tests is pointing to a subclinical cushings then in that case surgery may be offered earlier rather than later so that's something that i i mean in pakistan we have this problem that they don't come for regular follow ups so if you have that feeling and the multiple tests are really positive uh, for a subclinical cushings in an adrenal insulinoma we do offer them surgery but obviously in the west things are different uh, they do follow when they are called so the that may be slightly different in uk practice uh, we can also uh, check with professor jabbar um, he is currently working in dubai so what sort of challenges he is uh, getting in terms of management of adrenal insulinoma uh, dr jabbar we, ca we cannot hear you please uh, unmute your mic assalamu alaikum very nice presentation dr fahad you covered very well in terms of the standard follow ups i agree with most of what has been said i will just put some questions for dr fahad in the light of the challenges generally patients and the physicians face because it's not a very common condition so if you see a patient like this and then functionally there is nothing there the size is maybe 1 cm or so i've got a few patients i am following are there any nhs guidelines which say how frequently to follow especially in terms of imaging and in terms of functional assessment about this case subclinical we usually follow these patients once a year and we look at the comorbidity so if the patient has got diabetes hypertension osteoporosis or something then it deserve to be immediately taken care of either by the medical management but we know in cushing's medical management is not very useful so you have to go for surgical resection in these situations but uh, i think this is an important question which i would like dr fahad to ask and uh, uh, others may comment as well because as guidelines are something i don't understand they say you do the functional assessment every 5 years if it is normal which i particularly feel uncomfortable so sure, thank you i i think i agree with uh, uh, dr najmul islam and professor jabba i think uh, it depends i think if the patient is not going to come for follow up and we know that uh, we will miss this patient then we may uh, take an individualized approach in that case in general i think nhs there is no guidelines i think what we follow is that basically we discuss the cases on mdt and i think we have an mdt panel uh, with with a different endocrinologist and um, a radiologist and also our surgeon and we basically discuss with regards to the density if it's kind of in general the guidelines say less than 1 cm we do not need to follow or do any test in those patients depending on the clinical uh, features so if the patient has got clear cut cushings uh, symptoms and signs then definitely we need to do that but if it's less than 1 cm usually no further investigations would be needed as per the guidelines with some caveats if it's more than 1 cm and the 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 density is lipid rich i usually do not uh, do any further scans and i think that's usually what we we follow here um with regards to the functional assessment i think if it's um possible autonomous cortisol excess uh, or cortisol secretion then again uh, i look at the comorbidities and discuss with the patient that you may develop this in later in life um uh, and a simple question is that uh, i mean if the hb1c was normal when i see the uh, seen the patient and they they are now developing pre diabetes or they are going into diabetes then i probably will proceed earlier because we know that anybody with uh, uh cortisol level of more than 50 on 1 mg dexamethasone the mortality is high or the morbidity is high so i may proceed early but i may follow them up on a yearly basis uh some patients would want the test more uh, more uh, more regularly so i usually use other modality like late lysinive cortisol um 24 hour urine uh, cortisol or you i usually then sometimes use a higher dose of dexamethasone because we are looking at autonomous production we are not looking at the acth uh, production we are looking at autonomous production of cortisol from the adrenals um and if there is no autonomous uh, secretion in general what uh, using a higher dose of dexamethasone may help in distinguishing distinguishing that i have got a patient who hasn't suppressed on a higher dose but has got no feature the patient is slim perfectly slim and actually runs miles i think he's uh, around 60 year old has got no problems 
um, and his urinary cortisol and late life synaptic cortisol has been normal. So I'm following this patient up and the patient doesn't want surgery at this moment and he, he actually wants to be discharged. And I'm kind of keeping him in my clinic to say, look, the results are very borderline. And I think we need to follow you up. Uh, um, and again, I'm more inclined towards considering do I need to offer this patient surgery? But again, this is a diagnostic uh, and treatment challenge in this case. And this is an area where I see quite a lot of clinicians uh, um, uh, kind of uh, ponder and question that what's the next step. Uh, but I think individualized approach and having a method uh, and discuss using the multidisciplinary team if it's available. Uh, because sometimes having a different clinician with a fresh pair of eyes uh, may point towards a certain uh, 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 management or a treatment option. Thank you, Dr. Fahad. Uh, I think with the limitation of the time, uh, if there is any question we will ask later on, I will ask quick one question from which is actually uh, in the chat box. Um, so if you have to give importance, will you give importance to the size or attenuation? So if there is someone with uh, 20 Hounsfield adrenal mass, but the size is one centimeter, which one will you follow that patient or will you discharge? <laughs> That's a very good question. I probably will uh, follow the patient. I probably will do a, a contrast washout CT. And I, I will say that I have few patients between one to two centimeter with a Hounsfield of around 20 or 25. But once we did the washout scan, uh, actually uh, uh, the patient had a good washout of more than 60%. So it's actually an adenoma. Um, again, I think we have to see what CT has been done. So the first case, the first scan was a contrast CT because he had a trauma, uh, uh, trauma so he had a trauma scan. So the contrast was given. The Hounsfield in that was around 30. But when we did a non-contrast CT, um, actually yeah, the Hounsfield was low. So we also had to look at what, is it a non-contrast CT or not? Is it a dedicated adrenal CT or not? And we can use other modality of scannings as well, if you're worried. So I usually use a washout CT um, uh, in these patients. Thank you. So what we'll do, we will have a couple of more questions, but I think we will take it at the end. Um, so, let me, so our next talk is uh, Dr. Atif Munir. So Dr. Atif, uh, may I request you to, uh, in fact, sorry, and uh, this next talk is for uh, Dr. Umal. Dr. Umal is going to present uh, the next case. Uh, she's a consultant endocrinologist in Shokat Khanam Hospital. Um, so I will request Dr. Shokat, uh, Dr. Umal to please proceed. I'm just uh, sharing my slides. Are my slides visible? Yes, it, it, it is. Okay, uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Vakas. Um, I'm going to be talking about a rare adrenal pathology and uh, um, I'm going to try and uh, finish it in 10 minutes. It's a pretty long case, so I might be missing out on some details, which you are welcome to ask me in your question and answers. Um, and I've got some very interesting pertinent questions for our panelists as well. So I'm actually going to start with some past medical history and then sort of build up the case to where I saw the patient in my clinic. So a 21-year-old female, she initially presented to some clinic uh, after a right thyroid lobectomy. And her thyroid lobectomy had actually shown a medullary thyroid cancer of six centimeters. And at that time, she had a CT scan done, which showed a right adrenal gland, which was replaced by a 51 millimeter heterogeneously enhancing abnormality and a left adrenal that also showed a 15 millimeter nodule. And um, so this is the, these are the labs which I got from her past medical history from her records. And it showed that her calcitonin levels were still high at 297 or her CEA was still high at 40.9, given that she's got a history of medullary thyroid cancer. Her calcium and PTH were normal. At that time, we didn't have any plasma metanephrine or non metanephrines done or any other workup for her adrenal pathologies. Um, I did find a 24 hour VMA that was done and that was uh, normal at that time. So given these labs, uh, the doctor that saw her um, suggested a completion thyroidectomy, which the patient underwent. And again, from the other lobe, they found a two centimeter medullary thyroid cancer as well. And then she was planned for a right adrenalectomy after delivery. 
So one of the questions which I would be asking the panelists is, was this the right sort of order to do a, the thyroid first and then deal with the adrenals or should have been done the other way around? Um, so while she was planned for the right-sided adrenalectomy, she was found to be pregnant and so her surgery was delayed until she would deliver. However, unfortunately, during delivery, she went underwent a hypertensive crisis and had a stillbirth. After that, she was admitted for a right adrenalectomy. She underwent a laparoscopic right adrenalectomy and found to have a FIO, which was seven centimeters in size. And at this point, the patient was then lost to follow up. Um, and after, and this is all the details that I got from a medical chart. So I don't have any more details other than what I've presented here. So then she was lost to follow up and a, a couple of years later, she presented to my clinic and she presented with complaints of headaches and decreased vision. And so uh, an MRI neck was done given that she has history of MTC and she was found to has, have some residual soft tissue in her right thyroid bed and a couple of suspicious bilateral lymph nodes. Um, and a CT scan was also done which showed a residual right adrenal mass. And so the right mass, and let's keep in mind that she's already had a seven centimeter FIO removed from her right adrenal. So her right mass measured 4.8 by 4.7 centimeters and her left adrenal nodule measured three by 2.5. And when she presented to my clinic, her blood pressure was 140 by 80 and her heart rate was 82. So um, given this, obviously we did some workup and uh, blood work showed hypercalcemia and high PTH levels, also elevated plasma metanephrine and non-metanephrine levels, her cortisol, um, her cortisol, DHEAS and other uh, adrenal hormones were all normal. She order, also had normal calcitonin and CEA levels. But for completion, she did undergo um, FNA of her thyroid bed and her lymph nodes and they were reactive. So there was no evidence of any medullary thyroid cancer at that time. She underwent an MIBG scan as well, given her CT findings and her raised elevated uh, and her raised plasma metanephrines and normetanephrines, which was which actually showed bilateral FIO. And I'll be showing an image in just a second. For her uh, primary hyperpara picture, she underwent, her, uh, underwent a system EB scan, but that did not localize a parathyroid adenoma. So we started her on doxazosin initially, and then a week later, we beta blocked her as well, preparing her for surgery. So these are the labs that I talked about. Uh, as we can see, calcitonin and CEA levels were normal. Calcium and PTH was raised, and her plasma metanephrine and non-metanephrine were also raised. Uh, this is her MIBG scan, and it showed bilateral uptake. So she underwent bilateral adrenalectomy. Of course, we had a discussion in our MDT and it was decided that they're uh, significant enough. And since obviously we're suspecting that she has MEN2 syndrome, uh, she underwent a bilateral adrenalectomy. Post-surgery, she did pretty well. Uh, we were able to stop her doxazosin and metoprolol. She was obviously started on steroid replacement. Um, a couple of weeks after her surgery, we checked her plasma metanephrines and non-metanephrines that had normalized, and a CT scan, which we did post-op, also did not show any local recurrence. However, her calcium and PTH remain elevated, and so to deal with that, we did a repeat system EB scan. This is basically, these are basically your post-op labs. Calcitonin, CEA was normal again. Calcium, PTH remained high. Plasma metanephrine and normetanephrines had normalized post bilateral adrenalectomy. And so this time when we did a second system UV scan, you can see that there was some mild uptake uh, seen in the parathyroid gland. And so because of this uptake, she underwent uh, neck, neck exploration and parathyroidectomy. Um, the histopath showed benign thymic tissue and reactive lymph nodes. And unfortunately, her calcium remained high, even post-op. And so the plan was, since this was syndromic, to remove the remaining three parathyroid glands as well and re-implant one in the deltoid. However, on repeat scan, um, she was found to have an eight millimeter left adrenal bed mass again. So this is like the third time that she's uh, being diagnosed with a FIO, it seems. And when we checked her blood work, her plasma metanephrine and non-metanephrine were also raised. Now, they're not as high as they were initially when she presented, but they're above normal limits. And so we did a repeat MIBG, which showed mild uptake in the left adrenal bed, which was consistent with the eight millimeter adrenal bed uh, mass seen on the CT scan. 
And this time patient was completely asymptomatic. This was just as follow up that we did these tests before she underwent surgery uh, for her neck. And her blood pressure at this time was 120 by 70 and her heart rate was 72. No headaches, no vision issues. This time she was completely asymptomatic. So um, I guess the two points for discussion here was how to best manage this patient's recurrent pheochromocytoma because she's had a right laparoscopic adrenalectomy, then she's had bilateral adrenalectomies as well. Um, so she had a recurrence in the right side because she'd gotten it removed previously and now she's got a recurrence in the left side. So this is sort of like the third time that she is being diagnosed with a pheo given that this is syndromic as well, because she's got MEN2, she's got manifestations of medullary thyroid, FIO, and primary hyperpara. Do we just continue to do surgeries? Um, what we decided in, in our MDT was, since it's really small right now, it's just eight millimeters. And also because um, uh, she's asymptomatic, her blood pressure is normal, even her levels aren't that high. We don't plan on doing any surgery at this point. But this brought us to the second question that is it safe to perform parathyroid surgery for her given that she does have a FIO, which we know is cooking in there. And since she's absent, she's got normal blood pressure, normal heart rate, uh, do we alpha block her and then do the surgery? Or is it even safe to do the surgery in such a uh, patient? So we did decide to alpha block her and we gave her a small dose of doxazosin. Um, we haven't performed surgery as yet, although she is planned for it. Obviously, anesthesia and everyone's pretty apprehensive about it. But these were the two questions I really wanted to ask about this case from our respected panelists and see what they would have to say about this. And I'll be happy to take any questions as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Oman. Uh, ex excellent and very interesting patient. So I will request uh, Professor Najmul Islam uh, to answer on these questions. Thank but you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Umal, for your excellent presentation on this case, interesting case. Uh, first thing that I wanted to really was that first initial surgery. Uh, I mean, when uh, they found, they did a lobectomy and found that uh, it was a medullary CA thyroid. The next time they went for total thyroidectomy, I hope they did a central neck dissection as well. So that I, you probably you were not aware of it or I don't know. But again, that is something that should have been done. But the second thing is that the question about how to manage this recurrent uh, fuse that is happening uh, uh, despite uh, the surgeries, two surgeries that have, she has undergone. So, I mean, obviously uh, debulking is, is, the, the, is the way to deal with these things. And the clinically, she's not at the moment symptomatic, but if there is something visible on uh, imaging, then the surgeon's confidence, um, I mean, may have to, do, and he has to decide whether he can go and remove that small uh, recurrence of the pheochromocytoma. So that is a, this, a decision that has to be made in a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, but you can wait uh, until uh, it with a slightly bigger and the surgeon is confident and to go ahead and, because this is going to be this third surgery on that site. Uh, about this, uh, I mean, can uh, you're planning for a parathyroid surgery? And if you're not doing surgeries for the this uh, recurrent pheochromocytoma on the right side, then I think it would be safe to uh, pr prepare the patient with uh, alpha blocker like uh, dexosocene that you are planning to do, even if the patient is asymptomatic, because I think uh, that will decrease the chances of any hypertensive crisis uh, during the surgery. That is obviously not for that, uh, for the pheochromocytoma, but still there is slight risk of this uh, crisis even when you, during anesthesia. So that's my <clears throat> advice would be. And the sec and the last thing that I wanted to sh talk about was that when you went for uh, this uh, parathyroid surgery, uh, I think in few, in this men's syndromes, mostly it is hyperplasia in most of the cases. And your is initial system AV scan was not showing any as isolated adenoma. So you could have gone for the first time as well, uh, but, but again, uh, the second time there was some lightning, so you went for that, uh, for the removal of that adenoma, but uh, now the surgery should be a removal of all glands and implanting one of the glands into the neck or the forearm or the arm, wherever the surgeon is comfortable with. 
So thank you. That's my comment. Um, Dr. Abdul Jabbar, uh, if you can kindly comment on this. Yeah, very complex case. I think it is a very individualized decision to be made. And I usually put the doctors in a sensitive situation. If this patient was my mother or something, how would I manage it? So my question will be how symptomatic the patient is about hyperparathyroidism and what are the comorbidities you are experiences for which you are deciding to go for parathyroid surgery. The second thing about the same thing, FIO is there. It is a more dangerous. Uh, I can't, Professor Diva, we can't hear you. Uh, is the voice is still there or is it gone? No, I mean, we cannot hear Dr. Jabbar. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know what's the problem there. Um, I think. Dr. Jabbar, can you hear us? So I think uh, the connection is lost. Uh, so we have a couple of questions, but I think we can take the question at the end uh, after Dr. Atif talk. Uh, so now we can request Dr. Atif uh, to present his uh, case. So be before uh, pass, uh, I was just mm -hmm. wondering whether Umal wants to give us a a response to my comments. Really. Okay, so Dr. Omal, if you want to answer. Yeah, thank you. So, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Najmul Islam, your uh, questions which were uh, talking, you talked about medullary thyroid and the neck dissection. So, the first surgery was done outside. So, we don't really have much information on that. Uh, the second surgery uh, was actually also, uh, the second surgery was done here and they did do a central neck dissection and there were no notes with that. Yeah. Okay. And then I think Dr. Jabbar was talking about uh, indications for parathyroidectomy. So I didn't put it here because it would have made the case even more complex because there were so many things going on. Uh, but she, we did get a DEXA scan. We did show that she's got osteoporosis. She is just 27 years old. Her calcium is almost at 13 now. So all of these things made us think that she does need a uh, parathyroidectomy. And in syndromes, normally now we are going for removal of all parathyroids and implanting one in the deltoid, mostly over here by our surgeons. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we, can, uh, we can request Dr. Atif uh, so we can proceed with the presentation. Uh, Dr. Atif is a consultant uh, endocrinologist in Path Memorial Hospital. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ukas. Uh, just give me the go ahead that I'm audible and my slides are visible. Yes, we can. Uh, we can't. We cannot see your slides. We can see you, and we can hear you. Okay. Uh, just a second, then. Is that okay now? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, so we can see your slides now. Thank you. So let me make a start. So I've been posed with a, a rare challenge uh, in the form of this case recently. So I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to use uh, our expertise together and, uh, and solve this one. Let's make a start. So here's the story. This lady is 30. She, as per history obtained, had ambiguous genitalia at birth. She presented with what sounded like from the description by her, uh, her parents and family, like a salt wasting illness. Sorry for the spelling mistake. At when she was about six months old, she was diagnosed with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Her karyotyping at the time was 46 XX, commenced on steroids. Uh, which there is very patchy information available, but it does sound like that she was on steroids. Anyway, what was well, the other thing that was fairly obvious from the history, parents and herself, that the steroids were stopped of their own accord when she was 10. And till then, to date, she has never been on any steroid 
and has never ever been on fludrocortisone. Surprisingly, but endocrinology is no uh, short of miracles, there has been no adrenal crisis to date. He has expected primary amenorrhea, generalized hirsutism, and clitoromegaly. She was offered clitoroplasty at the age 20, which she and her family declined. So, presented in the emergency room recently with lower abdominal pain. She had a culture, a urine culture proven urinary tract infection, which was treated appropriately. Had an abdominal ultrasound done during the workup and treatment for her urinary tract infection, which expectedly showed a hypoplastic uterus and ovaries. And along with that, a, th a 13 centimeter echogenic left adrenal mass, which as per radiological description from the ultrasound, appeared fatty. And this is where the, this is where I got involved. Abdominal pain had settled and there was no history of recurrent abdominal pain. She looked pretty hyperpigmented. There was no postural blood pressure drop. She was significantly virilized. I will just present a brief endocrine workup. Anything else, uh, I'm happy to answer. Our testosterone levels were off the scales. 17 hydroxy progesterone level, expectedly high. She had a low serum 8 a.m. cortisol, not being on steroids. I had to do plasma metanephrines considering the mass and because I was just getting involved for the first time with no previous imaging or history at this point of time. And her plasma metanephrines were okay. So at least I was assured I'm not dealing with a fear from a I picked up the phone. I wanted some more imaging to be done. And so my radiology colleagues who I usually liaise with uh, suggested very rightly and appropriately that we should do, to, to kind of delineate this mass further, we should do an unenhanced un CT scan uh, followed by an MRI with contrast all in one go. And this is what she had. So there we go. I don't have the luxury of having my radiology colleagues with me in this presentation, but I will give it a go because it's pretty obvious and staring at us in our face. So this is the left adrenal mass we are talking about. It's pretty heterogeneous, a um, lot of uh, ecogenicity within it. And as per the radiologist's comments, there were specks of macroscopic fat within this huge mass with a non-uniform architecture at, as it is fairly obvious from this scan. So we have a left adrenal about 13 into 11 centimeter mass, well circumscribed, no signs of invading anywhere else. It, it is pressing on the left kidney. Um, and as per the radiologist comments, after the contrast was given, sorry, this is an MRI. I know it appears a bit blurred. It is probably a post contrast image. So as per the radiologist comments, there was some contrast enhancement within the mass. Uh, but there was no sign of vascular invasion. Uh, the other thing that was fairly obvious from the enhanced CT scan that the attenuation of the whole lesion as a whole was less than 10 Hounsfield units. So that was the piece of information we wanted from an unenhanced CT scan, which we got. So in summary, we have um, a left adrenal mass that's measuring about 13 centimeter. Before I move on to this bit, let me just take you back. So I had to, uh, well, in, in, in the meantime, I was digging some more history. It just I was very curious if she's had any previous imaging done just to compare what it was like if ever a scan was done. And to my luck, later on, we got another MRI, which was performed about three years ago. And that MRI showed a similar left adrenal mass, but that was about 10 centimeters with the same attenuation, same features, same consistency, but it was 10 centimeters in size three years ago. So we had two scans now over a period of three years. The other thing that the radiologist was very confident about that the appearances low of low attenuation and macroscopic fat distributed throughout um, this mass were very, very suggestive of myelolipoma and uh, my endocrine guru who taught me endocrinology thought if you have to trust your radiologist with one adrenal mass uh, with exact diagnosis, that's a myelolipoma. So the radiologist was very 
um, confident that these characteristics are very, very typical of an adrenal myelolipoma. That made me do my hunt for adrenal uh, myelolipoma literature search. Um, and I was quite surprised and disappointed that there was an extreme paucity of evidence uh, about myelolipoma in general and adrenal myelolipoma in particular. What I could find in the literature review was just a handful of case reports of sporadic myelolipomas and even a more handful of case reports of myelolipoma in context of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. What was fairly obvious from whatever scanty evidence I could find was A, myelolipoma general incidence in, in general population is about 0.2% um, and about 10% in context of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Most of them D9, malignancy, very rarely or hardly reported. They can be huge. We've had case reports in literature of about 31 centimeter uh, you know, myelolipoma being removed. Um, the, usually, the usual complication associated if you don't operate is a retroperitoneal bleed or symptoms in the form of recurrent flank pain. And the, most of the case reports, interestingly, have been written by surgical teams who have mostly ended up taking them out because by the time they saw them, they had no previous imaging and most tumors were more than eight centimeters. And the reasons reported to take them out were A, because they were huge, B, there was some radiological inconclusion about the exact nature of the mass, and C, they don't want to miss out on a neurocortical cancer. So that leaves me with a few discussion points uh, among our esteemed panelists, which include, this lady is not on steroid replacement, and from whatever I could find about adrenal myelolipomas, the course is, well, the possible or the postulated pathogenesis is um, unsuppressed ACTH surge resulting in fat and myeloid precursor re well, multiplication resulting in a myelolipoma. So if I give her steroid replacement started now, would that halt the progress of myelolipoma? It's a 13 centimeter mass and it does give me sleepless uh, nights uh, thinking that whether if I wait and watch, I don't want this to be turning out into a myelolipocytoma on the next scan with digestant or multiple metastases. So that's my fear. Does size matter? It's 13 centimeter. It is huge. The other thing I forgot to mention, sorry for that, that the radiologist also commented that this lady also has about a 2.5 centimeter um, myelolipoma in the right adrenal as well. So she's got bilateral, but the other one is 2.5. And the parasites are typical of a myelolipoma. It's got fat all over. This lady, the, the size has grown three centimeter over three years. Although there are still no convincing malignant features, but it is growing. Do we take it out or do we sit tight and observe? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atif. Um, so let me request Dr. Najam to see what his experience is regarding management of myolipoma and your uh, question, especially the first one. Vakas, uh, I actually I got disconnected and was not able oh. to hear uh, Atif's presentation, but I just could see the last slide in which he raised some discussion points. So I don't know the case very much, but uh, one thing that I was about the size of the myelo my myolipoma that he has is quite big, up 13 centimeters, if I'm right. Uh, it's quite big, uh, big, and it is really. Uh, though it's not showing any signs of malignancy at the moment, but it is quite big and I would be, I mean, uh, comfortable in getting it out uh, rather than sitting on it. And uh, so uh, that's my point of view, but I did not hear your whole presentation, so I may be missing things. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Atim, I understand there was myolipoma on the both sides. Yes, uh, she, so she has a 13 centimeter myelolipoma on the left and about a 2.5 centimeter on the right. The one on the right was not there in the last scan as for whatever information we have about that scan. So now, Dr. Najam, if so, this patient got a myelolipoma on the both side, if having a lipoma on the myelolipoma on both sides, 
will it change your management or will you consider like a unilateral removal first and uh, the uh, other I would I, I would I would just re remove the the big one, bigger one and follow the other one rather right? than going for both removal uh, Dr. Abdul Jabbar uh, yes sorry I got disconnected so Atif a very interesting and complicated case and I think your case will be and the outcome will be something reportable for people to learn. I've got a couple of cases I am following with myelolipoma here, five centimeters, not 13 centimeters. But the first thing I would suggest as you got some inputs about the ACTH dependency, and if you give a low dose steroids, and if you follow up for the size measurement after six months, it will be a learning, I think, because there, there is no precedence for that. We don't know what happened. As far as I know, for myelolipoma in the setting where you are talking about in the CH, steroids is not needed and a steroid doesn't help. But whatever information you gather from your literature search, both whether it changes the size or not is important. The second thing I agree with Dr. Najam, that the size is significant for 13 centimeter and there has been an increase in size. So even if you take the signs out, if I ask my patient, what do you want? It will depend very much what the patient wants because at the moment there is no immediate medical indication, but there is something which is reasonable size and is growing. And even if it is not something significantly malignant or anything, the size itself will create problem. So I agree with Dr. Najam on the side where it is big and 13 centimeter, I would go for operation rather than sitting, but I would suggest that if you give a six months trial so that we all learn what happens in these situations. Thank you. Thank and you. I can request Dr. Fahad uh, Wali as well. So are there any practice different in UK? Uh, thank you. I think this is a very interesting case. So we've got few myolipomas. In general, uh, we prefer not to operate on the myolipomas. Uh, but again, it depends on the size. I think with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, if there's an adrenal enlargement, and if it's a myolipoma, Will it change your management if you give them steroids? I think the problem we have is that this patient has got bilateral um, myolipomas. So I think the patient is not compliant. That's the first thing. Uh, with this. So if we take one adrenal out and five years down the line, we have to take the another adrenal out, the patient will with the steroids. So this is the, uh, the most important challenge here. Uh, again, what the patient wants here. Um, uh, we can, uh, I think the size is decently, uh, quite quite decent, quite big. Uh, the risk of bleed is uh, there. Uh, another question which we need to ask is the patient symptomatic. Is it causing pressure symptoms or not? So I think I wouldn't rush for surgery, but I think that will be in my mind that do we need to take this out? Will, will it cause problems? Again, individualized approach, discussion with multidisciplinary team will be needed. Another thing which we can consider is embolization uh, um, on the bigger one. Um, and that may help, uh, and that may uh, uh, basically uh, avoid surgery. But again, it's it's a difficult one, and I think we have got few patients with uh, adrenal uh, uh, um, masses with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. But if it's a myelipoma, it, we don't have much evidence that will it reduce the size or not. Uh, the lack of evidence doesn't mean that it will not work, or will it work? So we don't know. Uh, but in general, myelipomas are benign. I think the main problem is usually the pressure symptoms and the bleed, retroperitoneal bleed. Um, if it's uh, uh, um, of a decent size, five or six centimeters, or even eight centimeters, usually my practice, our practice here is that we usually don't um, operate on them unless they're causing problems. If it's definitely getting more bigger, then yes, uh, or having a patient sym have, are symptomatic, then we may go ahead with either surgery or embolization. I think the, those are the two things we can think of. But this patient is complicated by the fact of compliance. Uh, so if we've taken one out, the second one five years down the line is again 12 centimeter. If we take that out, the, if the patient is not compliant, the patient will be coming to the hospital uh, with adrenal crisis. So I think uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting case and uh, a challenging case. I think it's uh, it's individualized approach. I think I probably will uh, use this and kind of try to convince the patient first to start taking the steroids. And if the compliance is better, uh, then we can consider that. I think it's, it's, a, it's a difficult case and challenging case here. And how about the following this patient? So if you follow this patient, how frequently you would uh, do the scan for this patient? 
I wouldn't be doing the scan very, very regularly. I think I will go by the symptoms. Uh, if the patient is getting symptomatic, then I'll do the scan. Because we know that in general patients, uh, uh, this is a benign uh, uh, mass. And I, I think our radiologists are, are very, very confident here. They basically uh, shout out myolipoma straight away as soon as they see it. Uh, actually, I was putting the, one of the, the patients with myolipoma in my presentation, but because of the lack of time, I didn't put And then I knew that you were, uh, were going to talk about a myolipoma, so that's why I didn't put that in. But we have got a myolipoma, and we are basically just following the patients with symptoms. Thank you. Uh, so I think we got a couple of questions which uh, from, from the previous uh, presentation. And if there is more question, we can discuss in uh, between. So we got about 15 minutes left. So I think first I would like to ask a question from uh, Dr. Uman. Uh, so there is a question from, uh, from the audience. Um, so they suggest that uh, either RFA could be an option for recurrent pheochromocytoma. Um, so Dr. Umal. I, I uh, actually think... Uh, I think that's actually more of a comment uh, than a question because, mm -hmm. uh, again, this would be a discussion which we would have to have with the relevant departments, of course, because we're not, as endocrinologists, we don't offer RFA. So we'll have to talk to the relevant physician and see what they have to say about it. But that's a very good thought. That is something we can keep in mind when we discuss this patient text. So anyone, but given uh, that, but given that it's really small right now, it's only eight millimeters. I don't think anybody's really going to be wanting to do anything, knowing that this is probably going to come back because it's come back a couple of times already, and syndromic fios do come back pretty commonly. So keeping that in mind, I think maybe being less aggressive is the approach right now, given that the patient is asymptomatic as well. So from the panelists, if anyone have experience of using RFA for uh, from a few chromocytoma or adrenal lesion. I don't have any experience of RFA. So yeah, neither do I. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jabbar? Not for the radio frequency ablation, but in some of the patients, I think a couple, maybe Najim remembers as well, they were not only recurrent, they were malignant as well. So the radio ablation was an option. And I think if this FIO is uptaking a lot, the way we saw on the scan, so the radio ablation will be an easy approach. I think if the concerned radiotherapist or the radiology de radio therapy department agrees, I think for a patient like this with the MEN and the multiple site and the recurrence happening, this will be a quick and easy option. Okay. Dr. Fahad, do you have any experience of using RFA? I don't have uh, that much experience on using RFA in these patients. No. That's fair enough. Okay. And so looking at the questions we have is, uh, so there are, So there are a couple of comments, uh, but I think there are a few questions which is already answered during the presentation. There is one more, there is one question for Dr. Umal. So this is regarding, uh, did the first two adrenal histopathology specimens show that adrenal was removed and blocked, that is with capsule, or were there any malignant features? Dr. Umal. Yeah, so um, the first surgery, the right uh, laparoscopic adrenalectomy was done outside. And uh, the only histopath that we got was it was a seven centimeter pheochromocytoma. That's all that was present in the records. The other one, the bilateral adrenalectomy, which was open and was done at our center, uh, it was an end block resection with the capsule. And they did do the pass score, which they use for uh, determining whether there's malignancy or not. And it wasn't deemed malignant. And it, it was MEN2 where uh, the chances of malignancy is very low anyway. Um, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, so regarding the questions, I think that's all the questions were. Um, I got one question uh, from for Dr. Najam. So Dr. Najam, if, for example, uh, if you're looking for primary hyperparathyroidism and you are unable to localize the lesion with the system maybe scan, um, what else you could do? Um, for example, in Dr. Umal's case, they went for re-exploration. 
Um, so what else you should do? I mean, system maybe I routinely and I think it's recommended that we can use ultrasound as well to locate in parathyroid adenoma, and that also has a good sensitivity and specificity uh, by an experienced uh, ultrasonographist. Uh, so that is something that I do in most of my patients with primary hyperparathyroidism, both system AB and ultrasound. Uh, in, so our, otherwise, we need to lo localize the experienced parathyroid surgeon, which is the usual practice in the old, olden days, where it is written, rather than to start localizing a, a adenoma, localize or locate an experienced uh, surgeon who can explore and remove the adenoma or decide on, on his experience that these are hyperplasias and then he could remove three and a half or all remove and implant one of it in the neck or a, or a forearm. Okay. Um, so I think in Dr. Umal, your case, you, you uh, that patient underwent ultrasound as well. So we were still unable to locate uh, the, the lesion. Right. Um, I just want to add over here that um, obviously in syndromes, as Dr. Najam had also very correctly pointed out, it's mostly hyperplasia and not adenoma. And uh, so that's why normally it's best to just take out all of them, because even if you find the right no, uh, parathyroid gland that has undergone hyperplasia, two years later, you'll have the second, two years later, you'll have the third. So it's best to just take them all out and then implant them in a place where it's easier to take it out rather than uh, the neck undergoing multiple surgeries. But another thing that uh, when I was in the US, the surgeons over there used to do it and they might be doing it over here is that they, they used to do intra-op gamma probes where they would actually inject the patient and then with the intra-op gamma probes see where most of the dye is going and um, uh, trying to find the adenomas at that time. So that's one other thing that can be done for adenomas, but hyperplasia obviously is a separate story. One more thing that could be done, I mean, is that they can do uh, intraoperative PTH measurement as soon as they have removed it and they have to make arrangements with the lab to measure PTH and see the drop in the PTH levels if they have sex, and that will tell them that they have successfully removed an adenoma. But I think in this case, with the overall picture and the scan not showing an adenoma, it is strongly suggestive this is hyperplasia. So we should take the case as hyperplasia. And the last time I got disconnected, and that was my comment that uh, with so many problems and so many surgeries having happened to this patient, we should be prioritizing surgery with the uh, discussion with the patient. And we should look into how dangerous the problems are. How dangerous is hypercalcemia? How dangerous is FIO in these situations? Because we know she has gone through so many and it will come back and she'll have to go again and again. So that's where I was, I got disconnected last time and I was saying to set up the time frames, three months and six months and to really put the situation, if the course is slow, wait till it gets to the point where you need to operate. And if the course is not slow, obviously we don't have a choice and it's easy to convince the patient and talk to patient, problem is big, we have to do. My own perception at that time was the more dangerous is FIO, not parathyroid. Fair enough. Uh, so what about the role of uh, for intraoperative ultrasound? If anyone have experience of using that for, uh, local, for localizing the hyperplasia, or I'm not sure either that can localize the hyperplasia as well, the ultrasound intraoperative. So most of the centers will be using a scan gamma scans intraoperative. Intraoperative ultrasound in that setting, as far as I know, I may be wrong, is not very useful in particular for hyperplasia because it's very difficult to differentiate between that. But the gamma knife, not gamma knife, the gamma scan is useful and many centers are using it. But again, it depends on the mind frame. You have localized the adenoma, you don't know whether it's a single adenoma or multiple adenoma. I'm seeing the only one. The one which was the culprit, I've removed it or not. So in Dubai, many centers are using this gamma scan intraoperative. Uh, I remember we were when I was in the AKU, we were planning with the parathyroid surgeons to look at the ultrasound, but it wasn't very successful. Some of our surgeons were using it for pancreas, etc. So I will concur with Dr. Najem in those settings, if it is an adenoma, the 
ETH levels could be useful, but not very good. But it still helps you make a decision whether you should stop at one gland or you should go for multiple glands. Fair enough, thank you. Okay, uh, so we don't have any questions at the minute. Uh, so we can take if there is any comment from any of our uh, panelists, if there is anything they want to ask regarding these two very interesting casing cases. I think we had a good discussion. Uh, uh, I don't think I have any questions. Uh, but I mean, one thing that I wanted to uh, mention here that, uh, I mean, when we see a patient with adrenal incidentaloma uh, in, uh, in uh, referred to us, they already had the scans and then we have to sometimes see whether we need to ask for a dedicated adrenal protocol CT scan where, because the scan have been done for some other reason and they have not looked and they have not done the washout and other things. So occasionally we may end up doing another scan. So I would like to, for her to comment on this. What, what, what does, I mean, because these are incidentalomas and they had contrast given for some other pathology that they were looking for. So in that case, because they have not done a dedicated uh, adrenal protocol CT imaging. So do you, if there is a need, do you go for a, adrenal protocol, CT scan, repeat one, or uh, or you just uh, wait for the next time to do it when after a, a year or so? So um, uh, the first case we had, uh, a patient had a contrast, and I think we usually take this to our radiologists in the MDT. Um, and they usually will comment, so I think if they are confident this is a, a, a fat, uh, lipid-rich nodule, then we wouldn't proceed with anything further. But if the first case had a contrast, so the Hounsfield unit was around uh, 30. So we definitely went ahead and did a non-contrast CT in that uh, case. And by the time he had the non-contrast CT, it was around three to four months anyhow. So by the time he was referred to me um, and I've seen him, I've uh, discussed the case in the MDT, it was already three to four months. Uh, I, probably it was slightly longer. So the uh, and on that, it was quite quite a lipid rich nodule. The size hasn't changed, so it, it, I think we were very confident. Uh, so you definitely we go ahead with the non contrast CT if our radiologist um, uh, comment that yes they, they are not hundred percent sure on the the uh, on, on a previous uh, non dedicated adrenal scan. So some of the non dedicated risk scan they are very confident. They say look this is this is a lipid rich nodule, uh, and they are very confident. Then we won't go ahead. But it all, all depends on the discussion. Um, uh, but in the first case, we went ahead and did a non-contrast CT. Thank you, Fahad. I think there was one comment about nuclear Im medic medicine imaging. So in my center, we don't have that. I think there are only two uh, nuclear medicine imaging, uh, which is a methamidate PET CT, which is done, I think, uh, pioneered in Cambridge and UCL. And we do send our uh, uh, patients who are functioning there. Uh, uh, sometimes. So if the patient, let's say if the patient has been, uh, has got uh, con syndrome. So we want to uh, do an AVS and the patients are not very keen for an invasive procedure. So we do send them uh, for methomidate PET CT uh, to Cambridge and it, it has got really good results. So uh, it can be used uh, with quite good confidence. Uh, the last case I sent basically came back with the patient had a bilateral nodule and has got con syndrome. So um, we wanted to see which one is the dominant one and the patient didn't want an AVS. So we did send the patient for a nuclear medicine scan, um, it terminated PET CT and it wasn't conclusive. So the patient will ultimately have an AVS. Uh, and again, it goes by the patient choice. Uh, uh, we can do AVS in our center here, uh, but the patient basically didn't want an invasive procedure. Um, so yeah, I think it depends. Uh, I mean, we have got investigations and we need to use it depending on the clinical picture, but not all patients would we need to use it basically. Thank you. So we have a very interesting session where we have an excellent talk uh, regarding adrenal incidentaloma. Uh, we talked about um, how we approach the adrenal incidentaloma patients. Then we have a very interesting uh, discussion regarding bilateral pheochromocytoma, uh, a very complex patient. Uh, and then we have a myolipoma where uh, we have a discussion about how to monitor them. And it's quite rare. And the, and the, 
the there is no particular guidelines regarding it but we have a, a good discussion so i would like to thank everyone and i hope uh, all of our audience have enjoyed the session thank you very much with that i would conclude the session thanks and goodbye everyone thank you thank everybody you. khuda hafiz allah hafiz